These are the disciples who were with knees trembling, tummies doing, butter, doing somersaults full of butterflies, were hiding behind locked doors when Jesus rose from the dead. And who didn't even believe the ladies when they said, the angels have told us Jesus is risen and we've met him for ourselves. They didn't even believe them. They thought they were silly women. Nothing's changed, has it? And yet here we are 40 days later, because Jesus spent 40 days with them after he rose from the dead, teaching them and reminding them. We're at the end of that 40 days and Jesus is about to ascend into heaven to start his high priestly reign in heaven and all his enemies being made his footstool until he comes again on the last day of history for the day of judgment. He's just about to ascend and who does he call? and give his co-mission to, not spiritual supermen and superwomen, but to men and women who had publicly failed him only 40 days before, big time failures, and weren't even educated people, that most of them were, were fishermen, They're Levi who became Matthew was a tax collector, um, would have been a terrorist, Simon the Zealot. Uh, and he gives his co-mission to ordinary people who were mess-ups and who had failed him so abysmally just a month and a half before. And he calls them to Galilee. And this is the last thing he says to them before he ascends into heaven. So this is Jesus' last command to his church that he's not rescinded. This is as valid as any of the Ten Commandments. And what does he say to them? And notice what they're doing as they're worshipping. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Well, there's a human touch, isn't it? There's some going, is this really happening? Is, is this really Jesus risen from the dead and, and ascending into heaven and, and saying these things to us? Is this really happening or am I, am I daydreaming? Is this a mass hallucination? Some doubted. So even as the risen Lord of glory is stood there speaking to them, some are doubting. Is this really happening? Is it real? And uh, what does he say? Well, the first thing he, he says is he reminds them of who he is because that is what's going to carry the authority in the words that he's going to say. And, and who does he say? Well, he tells us about his great authority. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So how much authority? I'm just checking if you're awake. How much authority? Over how many events? Over how many lives? Over how many situations? Over how many of your words? Well, it's not rocket science, is it? All authority. Now this word authority sometimes in the Bible is translated power. We've, we've got a king who's got authority, but has he got much power? Has Charles got much power? No, he's not, has he? He's got a king, he's got a title, but he's got no power. He's a, he's a figurehead. That's not like our king. Our king is king over all the kings. He's got all authority. Over, over just Christians? Is that what he says? No. So the person you, God, God gives you an opportunity to, to share the gospel with someone. You've, you've been praying about God, give me opportunities. And, 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 and in, in work or in school, someone says, you go to church, don't you? And you're like, oh. Who's got authority in that situation? Who's got the power? Over just you? Or over the person you're speaking to as well. Oh, isn't that an encouragement? So what's Jesus saying? I've got it. I've got every situation, every conversation, every person, every event, 
My divine power and authority is right in the heart of this event. Isn't that encouraging? So is it down to who you are and, and how well you can share the gospel and even how well you're living as a Christian? No, it's not, because that is discouraging, isn't it? Jesus is saying, now here's my great authority. I've got authority in heaven and on earth. So in the spiritual realm where Satan and the evil spirits are trying to thwart every situation, trying to tempt you, trying to distract you, trying to divert you, trying to distract them from listening to what you're going to say to them, trying to make them think about a million and other one things and what you've got to say is a load of twaddle. Satan's telling you that, but who's got authority even over Satan? Jesus, because he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now what does he have to say then? Well who stood in front of them? A man. A man who's just been cruelly arrested and beaten and crucified and even the religious authorities have been saying this man's cursed by God because we know what it says. The Bible cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. And it didn't look like Jesus got any authority, did it, when he was naked, bleeding and dying, nailed to the cross. Except to one of the thieves, of course, who said, Lord, when you come in your kingdom, will you remember me? And of course, Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. He says, all authority on heaven, in heaven and earth has been given to me. So there's this great authority. There is not a single event that Jesus doesn't have authority over. There is not a single person you will ever come into contact with that Jesus doesn't have authority over. There's not a single conversation you will ever speak into that Jesus doesn't have authority over. Even the bad stuff. Isn't that encouraging? That's why in Romans it says, For we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God. How can they, even the bad things, because they're included in your things, work together for good? Because Jesus has authority in heaven and earth over all things. Even the things that look really bad that come into your life. He's got authority over them. His power is at work and being displayed. So he says, all authority given to me. So, so we better listen anyway, because he's got all authority. So this is great authority. And so then he gives the great commission. Therefore, go. He says, I've got authority, not just in heaven, but every single square inch of this world, wherever you will find yourself, I've got authority there. So go and bring my authority into that situation. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say make professors, as in professing, I love Jesus. Because it's easy to say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. What he says is, go and make disciples. Not just tell them about Jesus, not just share the gospel and pray with them, but disciple them. Make them followers of Jesus. So their lives are radically transformed. Go, therefore, because I've got authority over everything, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So does that include Wales? Or hasn't Jesus got any authority in Wales? Well, if you look at all the amount of chapels closing in Wales, you'd think he hasn't got authority, wouldn't you? You, you, you listen to what, what the media are telling us about the death of Christianity in the West. You, you'd think Jesus 
hasn't got authority, but that's not what he says. So don't get your worldview from circumstances, get your world root view from Jesus and what Jesus says. He says, I've got authority, even where it looks like Christianity is on the decline and on the wane and where people don't want to listen and where chapels are closing down. No, you go there and you preach the gospel and you make disciples. It includes Wales. Of course, Wales is in the world, but I'm sorry for you Welsh people, Wales is not the world. There is a world outside of Wales. It really is. And I, I've heard people say, even pastors say to me, but, but Merv, you know, things are so desperate in Wales. What are you doing going to India and Nepal and Sri Lanka and Pakistan? I go, well, it is the first thing, mate. Jesus tells me to. And I'm going to obey Jesus, not what you say. Go into all the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all called to go cross-cultural, although if you're English living in Wales, you're a cross-cultural missionary. And if you're a Welsh person going to an English university or a Scottish university, you're a cross-cultural missionary. I'm married to a Welsh woman and I'm English. I'm a cross-cultural missionary. In fact, it was a Welsh woman who get becoming a Christian and praying for me and dragging me to church that made an Englishman a Christian. See, so Welsh people can be used to reach pagan English, sharing the gospel, so we become Christians. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And you go, but yeah, but I'm stuck in Wales. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't go overseas. I'm, I'm old. Well, let me give you an example. So I'm halfway up the Annapurna mountain. So that's uh, third highest mountain in the world. It's uh, just, just a little bit less than Mount Everest. And I'm on a trek going to Annapurna base camp, 14,800 uh, 14, feet. And I'm with some Nepalis uh, from a church in Kathmandu and it's with their youth group. And the idea was that all the youth coming on the trek would bring a non-Christian friend. So in the seven days of walking up to Annapurna base camp and back down, we can share the gospel with them. Only one non-Christian came, poor lad. Did he get Bible bashed? And he was our photographer. But every morning we, we'd meet before breakfast and we're praying, Lord, but yet we're, we're enjoying your creation. We're, we're doing the Annapurna trek. It's beautiful, um, but we want to be witnesses for you. So just lead us to people and into conversations where we can share the gospel. And uh, so we get up to Annapurna base camp. Beautiful. You see the glaciers coming down. Stunning. Amazing. Um, we start to walk down and our Sherpa was a little bit on the portly side. He was fat and he wasn't very fit. And I'm with the two, pa two pastor's sons who were getting very bored going at a snail's place of this rather rotund Sherpa. So I went, Pastor Merv, you're fit. Shall we go on in front of them? Now I did mountain leadership. One of the first rules of mountain leadership, never go in front of your guide. We thought, I know better. I'm with two Nepali boys. We've been watching the Sherpas that shippers go really fast downhill and they don't, they don't run like that. They bounce from side to side as they're going down. And we're, we're rocking, we are going down this pass now. We are going really fast. Can't even see the rest of the team. My phone goes and it's the guide. Uh, where are you now? I said, well, I reckon we're a good few hours in front of you. And he says, oh, can you find out where you are? So I get the boys to ask some of the people working in the fields, you know, where are we? So I said, oh yeah, we're, we're in this village. He went, you've gone down the wrong valley. You're about four or five hours away from where you should be. And I'm like, oops, should have listened to my mountain leadership training, shouldn't I? So he said, do you want me to come and get you? And I'm thinking, that's gonna take ages. I said, no, it's all right. Um, well, we know where we're going to go now. There's loads of people working in the terraced fields. We'll keep on asking them. We'll find our way. Don't worry about it. So we go for about another hour in the right direction. And there's this elderly lady bending down, pulling carrots out of a field no wider than this platform. So I go up to her, and in my broken Nepali, I ask her where we are. She immediately puts her hand into a pocket and comes out with a wad of gospel tracts. 
in Mandarin, Cantonese, Italian, German, French, English, Hindi. All she speaks is Gurum, which is one of the Nepali tribal languages. But she knows that Jesus is bringing all these tourists from all these other countries to go trekking up and down her valley. And I said, oh, in my broken Nepali, I said, no, no, sir. I'm a believer. And uh, so we get to share testimony. She's the only Christian in her village. Imagine how hard that is. The next Christian is a four hour walk down the mountain to the river where there's another Christian in another village. And once a week, she walks the four hours down the mountain to read the Bible with this other Christian and pray. And then she has a five hour walk back up the mountain to her village. And then a few days later, her friend will walk up so they can read the Bible and pray and then walk down. And here she is, only speaks a tribal language and she's got a handful of tracks in all these other languages. How come? Because how can Jesus use a tribal lady living up in the Himalayas who only speaks her tribal language, but she believes what Jesus said here? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, therefore go and make disciples. So we shared testimonies. I tell you, the tears were streaming down her face. And I said, what can we pray for, for you? She said, pray that Jesus will use me to start a church in my village. Now, I remember a name. It's Raj Kumari, which means princess. That's quite good for a Christian lady, isn't it? You know, princess, because that's what you are if you belong to the King of Kings. She's Princess Kumari Devi. So keep on praying for her that Jesus will be using her to share the gospel in her village. But to all these tourists coming up and down trekking, and you think, she believes this. Here's the challenge do I? Do I? Do you? Making disciples, baptising them and teaching them everything that I've taught you. So we've got Jesus' great authority, Jesus' great commission. What's our great comfort and consolation? Jesus doesn't ask you to do his work by yourself. Because you can't do it and I can't do it. Don't think Kim and I are anything special. We really aren't. We're just like you. What does Jesus say? And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So who goes with you back to your unbelieving husband or wife? Who goes back to you to your unbelieving children or grandchildren? Who goes with you into, into school where you're the only believer in your class? Or it can be even the only believer in your school. Who goes with you to university, which is not exactly pro-Christian? Who goes with you into your workplace? Who goes with you when you're filling up the car with petrol or in Tesco's or Waitrose or Sainsbury's? Who goes with you when you're doing Sunday school? Who goes with you when you're doing youth club? Who goes with you... Wherever you go, who? Jesus. And what's he got authority over? All things. And you go, but oh, I'm so weak. I'm so puny. I know so little. I'm such a failure. Amen. We are. But who goes with you? Whose work is it? Someone who's not weak, who's not puny who's not a failure and who knows everything and who's got power over everything. Who goes with you? Jesus who loves you, who's loved you from before the creation of the world, the Jesus who humbled himself for you, the Jesus who was made sin for you, the Jesus who was nailed to the cross for you, the Jesus who rose again for you, the Jesus who's ascended into heaven and even now is interceding for you, the Jesus who's going to come again, not to be born in a stable this time in an obscurity, but in all his heavenly glory and majesty with all his holy angels and all the believers who've ever lived from the time of Adam and Eve they're going to come with him who goes with you he does hallelujah 
Isn't that incredible? Why would he want to go with you and me? I mean, look at us. I mean, the world don't want to go with us. I mean, they're not exactly queuing up to meet us, are they? I mean, look at us. But look at, look at the first disciples. They weren't anything special. They just deserted him and forsaken him and let him down so publicly. And he says, I will go with you. Yeah, but so you know you're going to mess up, don't you? You are. And I will. Kim and I will mess up in these next few months. Absolutely guaranteed, because we're sinners. What does he say? I am with you always. So can you mess up so badly that it will stop him going with you? Can you fail him so badly that it will stop him going with you? No, because this is his promise. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then evangelism is finished, because when Jesus comes again, that's it. So will there ever be a conversation or a situation that Jesus isn't with you? No. No. Yeah, if you know your Old Testament, just the second book of the Bible, Exodus, you'll know these are virtually the same words Jesus said to Moses. When Moses goes, who am I? I can't speak. I'm unlearned and they're never going to listen to me. And, and the Lord says, go. He goes, how can I go? I will be with you. So he's not changed, has he? He says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that amazing? Did you wake up this morning thinking to yourself, Jesus is with me, and he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. He's going with me every step of the way, and he's got authority over every step of the way. Isn't that incredible? That's our incredible Jesus. And he says... I've got a co-mission for you. You're my missionaries. There's a co-mission. We're in this together. I am going with you. And it's my ability, my power. All I want is your availability. Now go. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It's very simple, very clear, but we find it very scary. We pray that you would just impress upon us your great authority and love for us, the, the greatness of this commission that you've given us, and this great consolation that you go with us into every situation, every event, every circumstance, every conversation. And there is nothing we can do or say, no mess up failure sin that will be so big that will stop you going with us hallelujah what a wonderful savior amen okay if we can stand we're going to sing our last song together and it picks up on those verses from the Bible and just reminds us what Jesus has called us to.
If we can raise our hands, we just like at the end of the service to say we're receiving uh, what Jesus has spoken to us. So we're just going to turn to that part that Merv preached. And just a final reminder, isn't it? This is what Jesus says to you. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen.